Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Today we're going to focus upon some of the major events that are taking place around the world and what the logical, practical, legal role of the United Nations is in dealing with many of these problems. I guess this is an expert on the United Nations. Stefan Dujaric is the spokesperson for the UN Secretary General Antonio Gures, Guterres. He has worked under three Secretaries General in the United Nations and he also before worked for a variety of private sector news outlets. Stefan Dujaric, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you, Bill. It's great to be here as always. With I appreciate you being with me. You're dealing with yeah. so many hot issues, yeah. hot button issues, mm -hmm. that you really could be on a show every week. <laughs> Come right down to it. You may want to start your own show. Yeah. <laughs> you may want to do that. Well, I do have my own show. You know, we do a press briefing every day at we, noon. That's right. That is a bit of a live television we do every day. Exactly. So. Tell yeah. us about that. So my one of my primary roles is to be the main point of contact between the media, uh, and the United Nations, the Secretary General more specifically. We have about 200 journalists or so that are accredited full-time in the United Nations. They have their offices, they come in the UN building, they come from the world over. And every day we do a press briefing for them, which is really for us a, an act of transparency. I, I deeply believe that as a publicly funded institution, we have a responsibility to make ourselves available to the media. It's also a way for the Secretariat to inform member states of what we're doing, because I know the permanent missions watch what we say. And I know that because when, on a regular basis, I make a mistake or say something they don't <laughs> like, there's a message from an ambassador when I get back to my desk. You hear about yeah. it. <laughs> and, you know, and it's a, it's a tool for uh, internal communications. Like any big organization, public or private, it's always good for everybody to know what, uh, mm -hmm. what the boss is doing and what he's thinking. Mm -hmm. Transparency and accountability are very important. Indeed, in and you know we, we every institution, especially exactly the UN. And I think we we have a. I think every public institution has that responsibility, and I think we take this uh, we take that responsibility very seriously mm -hmm. here. And our viewers can go to your website at www.un.org to right, get more and information, they can watch, uh, and the they can watch it. The the webcast, the web TV .un org. Mm -hmm. You can watch only the noon briefing. You can watch the Security Council, General Assembly, just about every public meeting that uh, takes place at the UN is available for people to watch if they don't have a Netflix subscription. <laughs> <laughs> well, even if they do, they yeah, can. Yeah, exactly, exactly. They can do both, probably. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you, you have a very distinct, a very unique honor. You've worked with three secretaries yeah. general is in this position, with Kofi Annan, with Ban Ki-moon, mm -hmm. and now Antonio Guterres. How has your position changed over the years, uh, going back 10, 12, 15 years, how, how has the reporting changed, the issues changed? Well, first of all, I have to say it's, it's been an immense privilege to be able to serve uh, three amazing diplomats, three amazing uh, secretaries general, and so it, it's very humbling in a sense to have been able to, to do that. You know, the, the world has changed, obviously. The, some of the underlying problems haven't changed. I think from, from where I stand, what has changed is the technology, the technology of reporting. There is much more pressure now on reporters to report constantly uh, through Twitter, through any sort of social media. So that, that pressure then comes on to us as an institution to react quickly. The problem is that the, you know, while the, the electrical cycle of the news cycle has sped up a hundred times, mm -hmm. The, the electrical cycle of diplomacy still moves at a very deliberate pace. So as a spokesperson, I'm kind of stuck in the middle of trying to match the needs of both. Uh, but sometimes we, um, you know, there's pressure on us to speak quickly, but for very good reason, we sometimes have to take our time, figure out what the facts are before we react. National governments are able to react much quicker than we are, but we have to, our political space is a bit narrower, so sometimes we have to take our time and be more deliberate in what words we use and how we react to world events. Mm -hmm. And you want to get it right. <laughs> you want to make yes, sure we it's can. correct. Yeah, exactly. We don't, right. we, we don't, we do <laughs> not want to get it wrong. Too hard to go back and read. Exactly. <laughs> and, and you know, that's the difference. I mean, as, as journalists, if you make a mistake, people can issue corrections. If we, s you know, if we make a mistake, if we use the wrong data, use the wrong words, it's almost mm -hmm. impossible for us to, to correct the record. Mm -hmm. Now, you worked for three different secretaries mm -hmm. general, all had strengths and some weaknesses mm -hmm. to go along with it, mm -hmm. I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, how would you, not, we won't get into great detail, but how would you define their management style? All of us have different management styles, but some of us are, they overlap, but how well, would I mean, each I, I be classified you know, in one they, this, uh, in a quick kind of compare and contrast, mm -hmm. uh, Kofi Annan was a product 
of the United Nations, right? I mean, born in Ghana, moved to the States, went to McAllister College, uh, but basically his whole professional life was within the UN system. Started mm -hmm. off the lowest professional rung up to Secretary General. So he, the, 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 the UN was in his blood, the charter was in his blood. He knew how to make the organization function. He knew how to, what buttons to push mm -hmm. to change it. But he was a secretariat person and a UN person through and through. Ban Ki-moon was a child of the United Nations. And while he did his whole professional career in the Korean Foreign Service on the national side, as a young boy, as a young man in on the Korean Peninsula, during the war, in the aftermath of the war, he was fed with UN rations, right? Mm -hmm. He learned on UNESCO books in classrooms that had been, uh, that had been destroyed. And the US-led intervention on the Korean Peninsula was done under UN auspices. So the soldiers that he saw t that helped him for him were UN soldiers. And he was what we now call an internally displaced person during, during the war. So for him, the UN was viscerally in his heart. And he knew he owed so much of his own survival as a child and his family's survival to the UN. So when decades later, he became Secretary General and visited camps for displaced people in, in Africa or Asia. He had a real bond that he could speak to, to these children, to these people. Now, Antonio Guterres is a completely different animal and in the sense that he's the first Secretary General to be a politician. And, and I mean that in the best possible mm -hmm. sense. Um, 30 more years of uh, membership in the Portuguese Parliament, Prime Minister, headed up a minority government. Um, and so when you think of the Secretary General often described as the world's chief diplomat, all his interlocutors, 193 of them, are all politicians. Mm -hmm. And so he's the first Secretary General to speak their language and to understand intrinsically what the pressure of domestic policy on foreign policy. And I think that's a huge attribute for any Secretary General to have. Mm -hmm. As I think back several years, 13 years plus going back, I guess, Ban Ki-moon had five priority areas when he came in. Uh, does Secretary General Guterres, does he have priorities or does he look at it from sort of a macro approach? What's he, what, what did he want to focus upon when he came in three well, years ago? I mean, I think if you look at, uh, if you were to boil down his agenda to one word, I would say it's prevention. Mm -hmm. After politics, he became head of the UN Refugee Agency for 10 years at a time where there was the largest spike of refugees pushed by conflict, partly by climate change, but mostly by conflict in, in the Middle East, in, uh, in Afghanistan. And as head of UNHCR, you help people by giving them a Band-Aid. But I think his, uh, his focus now is how do you prevent this mass movement of people, right? And you prevent it by... Uh, by, uh, by intervening diplomatically early, trying to prevent conflict, but you also prevent it by building resilient societies, by ensuring that societies respect the rights of women, give them access to health care, give them access to education, that the, the environment is clean, that kids have access to education. All these things that are reflected in the 17 uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Because you have to think of yourself how bad can life be at home when you're standing on the shores mm -hmm. of the Mediterranean in Libya and you think putting yourself and your family on a boat where there's a 50-50 chance you might die is a better option than staying at home. So he's focused on building healthy societies. And we do that through investing in the 17 uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Mm -hmm. And these 17 Sustainable Development Goals are logical, practical, achievable, they were launched from what, 2016 to 2030, mm -hmm. along the 15 year continuum time span, and to uh, eliminate poverty, to eliminate hunger, to combat climate change, to provide quality education, empower women. What are some of the ways that the United Nations is working to achieve those? I know you have agencies working on them, but there, there are certain focal points that you're involved in now that you're uh, trying to get galvanized to get people's attention to focus on these well, issues? I, I mean, you know, they're, they're not, in a sense, the UN's goal. They're global goals. Right. They are agenda-setting goals for communities, uh, whether at the national level, the sub-national level, or even uh, the, uh, the municipal level. I'll give you an example. I was in Denver last year to speak for UN Day, 
and the municipality of Denver uses the sustainable development goals as kind of uh, as an agenda to deal with issues of homelessness on housing and education so they're everyone's goals the UN comes in in terms of mobilizing resources on mobilizing popular will and in and, and helping national governments meet the targets of these goals through capacity building and through resource mobilization, to, to mention only two. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the cities, uh, especially around the United States, but cities all around the world, thousands of them really, are mobilizing to help achieve the sustainable development goals. You have service organizations like Rotary International, Kiwanis, Lions, they line on, they line up with certain goals, some support all of them, mm -hmm. but they are actually a, a very critical as far as to helping to achieve these. As you mentioned, these are global goals. These are for everyone, but of course, leave no one behind. There is no one behind. And it, it's not up to, governments alone can't achieve these mm -hmm. goals, right? The United Nations alone can't achieve these goals. It involves the private sector. It involves civil society that needs to drive the agenda. I mean, we're lo looking at the mobilization on climate. It's due a lot to popular mobilization, right? Uh, if you look at polio, to an example, you know, the, the we're almost at the eradication of polio. I think you know Nigeria and uh, and Pakistan yep. and, right. and and maybe one or two others are still outliers. But that could not have been done without the the push of Rotary International. You know, they mobilized their network throughout the world, and that's it's. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, we're talking about the biggest changes in the last few years. One of the biggest change, in a way, that c which is continuing, is the distribution of power. Fifty years ago, the power was in the hands of governments, right? They almost had a monopoly on, on, on power, on how to change societies. Mm -hmm. Now you look at the role of civil society, uh, foundations, the, the private sector. They have a huge amount of power. We as individuals, as consumers, also have a huge amount of power. So the UN is about bringing all these different people together, all these different stakeholders, as we like to say, together under the UN tent to figure out how we fix the problems and how we move forward. Mm -hmm. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guests. We would encourage our viewers to go to our website at www globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with a PBS or community access television station, or perhaps an educational institution that has an intra campus television hookup, or you just have a website, you like our shows and you want to share them, please feel free to do so. Global Connections Television is provided as a public service at no cost to help us better understand international issues and how they impact our lives. Today we're talking with the spokesperson for the Secretary General of the United Nations, and that is Stéphane Dujardic. Stéphane, welcome back to the show. You, we bro. didn't go always very far. No, no. <laughs> we, <laughs> we, we only have 26 yeah, minutes. Exactly. We can't afford we're, to lose yeah. it. You, you, you hit my button a minute ago and you said the Polio Plus program with mm -hmm. Rotary International. I, I'm a Rotarian, have been for 100 years, seems like, but it is. Rotary, you look great. I won't <laughs> thank you. <laughs> but Rotary and the United Nations have really been the boilerplate of a public quasi, yeah. a, a private sector quasi public mm -hmm. institution, and how you can team up on a major international issue, a problem. And the a Polio Plus program is the largest, you know, yeah. largest international health program ever undertaken, mm -hmm. ever undertaken. And of course, it was the World Health Organization, UN Children's Fund, Rotary, obviously, and the Center, U.S. Centers for Disease Control, and now the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and many others are involved in it, but you're right, we're just that close to eliminating polio, and that will be just a remarkable accomplishment. But it, it does show that they can work together. It, they have to work together. Exactly, there is have there to, they, not they can, have, that's right, right. They have to work together. And I think, you know, R Rotary is a, is a great mm -hmm. example of people who are leaders in their communities, in the business communities, who want to do more, right? And they want to mm -hmm. help, and it channels that. The UN is a great partner. I mean, the Rotary is, you know, is is like the UN is is in every in every country in the world uh, with a deeper penetration because you're in every mm -hmm. in in every city in every place, mm -hmm. and and so it's an it's a natural match. And and I think the the polio example is I said is a great example. And uh, you know, I have to tell you, every time I, I think about the polio uh, example, mm -hmm. I and I, I don't want to veer off, but I also get so upset at the disinformation we're seeing about vaccines mm -hmm. these days. 
when you think of all these people who put their lives at risk to vaccinate children against smallpox, against polio, in the front lines, right? In the middle of wars in Somalia and Iraq, and yet in developed country, we're now, because we've been so safe, right? Mm -hmm. We're seeing this ignorance spread. And I, I think, you know, Rotary and others now have a responsibility also to spread the word about the critical need for continuing to vaccinate people, whether you live in a rich country or a poor country. Mm -hmm. And uh, not to dwell on the service codes too long, but also give them, fair t give them equal time. Um, Kiwanis has been right. involved with the UNICEF, UN Children's Fund on iodine deficiency mm -hmm. disorder programs. Alliance have been involved with, uh, ro uh, with the United Nations various agencies mm -hmm. on vision programs and what have you. And of course, this whole issue of inoculations and that type of thing is uh, the vaccines yeah. is extremely, right. extremely I mean, important. you know, and I've, I've had the, 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 the honor of speaking to Rotarians in the Northwest, or to the Lions when they came here to the mm -hmm. UN. And I've always been very moved by, by the passion of these people and their, their, their willingness and almost their need to help and to be involved. Their, their unwillingness to sit on the bench on the sidelines, right? They're always ready, they're up, and they want to help. And, and I think the UN helps build these partnerships by bringing everyone together. And that's the UN as a convener, in a sense. Mm -hmm. It certainly is. It's the only, really, the, the, interna the multilateral inter international institution that brings right. all the countries of the world together. Exactly. There is no other UN. Right. Even with its warts and imperfections, there's still, there's no other UN. So the yep. idea is to make it better and to Indeed. improve it. Indeed. And that the Secretary General is very much focused on improving the uh, the way the UN operates, mm -hmm. ensuring that the UN staff is much closer to the field than uh, than headquarters, uh, and that we bring value for value for money. Mm -hmm. That that reminded me of I was saying back to Kofi Annan, mm -hmm. and when he came in, he had a two-track reform mm -hmm. program, and we won't go back and revisit that. But uh, the secretaries general since Kofi Annan have all tried to improve the internal operating efficiency and effectiveness of the United Nations, as well as its outreach, its effective yeah. outreach. What are, are there a couple of examples of what uh, Secretary General Guterres has done to improve or make the UN more efficient and more effective? I think one of the best ways to, to show what, what the Secretary General has done is on gender. Mm -hmm. And he has been laser focused since the beginning on bringing gender parity to the United Nations. His leadership team is now more than 50-50 women. Uh, the number of the resident coordinators who represent the UN in every country, uh, we've gone beyond parity. Uh, we've increased the number of women who lead peacekeeping missions and political missions. And I think that is something he's achieved in, in basically in two years, right, through, through his drive. And that is to make the UN more reflective of the world that we're in. We always tend to lecture other countries about issues of gender, so we had to get, make sure to get our own house uh, our own house, in order. And then the other reform stream is on really ensuring that the political and the peacekeeping work much better together in a much more coordinated fashion, that the resident coordinators that I just spoke about report back directly to him as opposed through of the UN Development Program to make them more representative of the Secretary General and uh, stronger coordinators of this vast sea of acronym that is the UN family because the Secretary General, though he symbolizes the organization, has constitutionally has very little authority uh, over the rest of the UN system. You know. The World Health Organization, to mention just one, is an independent agency. So it's all about the Secretary General's representative on the ground coordinating the work of the UN to make sure that every dime that is spent is spent efficiently. Mm -hmm. Many of the scientists, in fact, 97% of them right now <laughs> are close to it, according to the statistics, and many policymakers and the general public just are around the world are feeling that climate change yep. is our number one problem. How are, uh, what's the UN doing? I know there's so many <laughs> initiatives underway, but what are one or two ideas that the UN's promoting right now to focus attention on this climate change problem and to help us at least ameliorate it or slow it down or to try to get everybody involved? As you said, everyone needs to be involved. It's not the UN doing the job, it's everybody. Well, I mean, uh, you know, the Secretary General is, is very focused on this. He's uh, bringing together member states for a summit uh, mm -hmm. in a couple of uh, weeks in early mm -hmm. September, and he's told them to come with ideas and not speeches on implementable 
ideas on how we're going to tackle the problem. But I'll give you an example of, of, of his leadership is really, let's say, bringing the business community together, you know, bringing investors into the UN tent to talk to them about climate change, insurance companies, right? Because it's, again, it's not something that governments are going to be able to do alone. The business sector has to move. And if you've seen, sometimes the business sector, once they've gotten hold of something, are now moving, I think, faster than, mm -hmm. than governments. A lot of industry is moving faster. Municipal uh, governments, you know, the, the city governments and state governments are really at the forefront. And so they now have a seat at the table at the UN on climate uh, discussions. Mm -hmm. So it's about bringing those people together, sharing the ideas, and I, I don't want to say lock them in the room, but ensuring that everybody is focused on it to put the right policies in place. Mm -hmm. Because we're all going to lose. If we lose the planet, Indeed. we've lost the game. Indeed. There's no way yeah. we can get around Indeed. it. Well, the United Nations, again, is so involved in so many important issues and uh, that we need to learn much more about the, the mm -hmm. United Nations. Uh, is uh, what's, what's the, you're in the Department of Global Communications, I guess, or you're part of that group, or you're the spokesman. Right. Yeah, that's right, closely related. Yes. What, what can the UN do and other organizations do to help people better understand the United Nations and how it touches all 7.7 .7 billion people on the planet. Some UN agency is touching your life right, positively exactly. every day. So how well, can I mean, you, you do know, that? When, you, when you, you, you have, obviously, if you're in developing countries, you, you get humanitarian help, development, mm -hmm. but even, you know, those of us who live in the, in the global north, when you put, you know, when you take a plane, right, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, you, have a, you take a plane from New York that goes to London, the reason these airports can talk to each other is thanks to the International Civil Aviation Authority. If you still like me and you put a letter in the mail, not many people <laughs> do it, but you know, you have I the International too. Postal <laughs> Union, the, the Telecommunications yeah. Union, all these UN kind of forms, norm setting organizations, technical, to make sure that we can all speak to each other and that the connectivity in the world works. So that's a way that the UN touches our, our lives. But the responsibility mm -hmm. to talk about the value of the UN obviously lies with the organization, but it is also important for for governments to explain to their people why it's important that some of their tax money goes to the UN, right? Because the, the UN is only as strong as its membership wills it to be. And it is very important that all governments be very clear to their own citizens why the UN is so important. So it's not mm -hmm. just left, you know, as always, uh, the, the it's always best to have others talk about how, how good you are. <laughs> you right? Sure. Instead of, it's not, should not be just up to us to, to communicate about the UN. We all have a responsibility. Mm -hmm. That is a perfect point to end on because so often in the past, the UN and some secretaries general mm -hmm. have been uh, really s have been scapegoats mm -hmm. for yeah. problems. I remember in Rwanda, the UN got blamed for that, but really it was not the UN per se as an institution, but individual well, countries I mean, who were involved right. in that. But uh, that is a, a great way to end it because the UN can only be as successful as its member states yeah. will allow it to be and only if they get involved and if they participate and then if they work together on these issues, never agreeing on everything, everything, yep. but certainly working towards a common goal, and then it will be successful, or at least it will not fail completely. Right. But Stefan Dujaric, I want to thank you so very much Bill, for a very interesting and a very informative great program. Great to be here. Thank, thank you, you so much. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.